showers every morning, practice intermittent fasting, running with minimal shoes, and I even use creases to get rid of my glasses. So there's a lot more on the site about that, but I want to talk about today is something a little bit different. Um, most of you are here because you practice some aspect of an ancestral lifestyle, diet, nutrition, exercise. But how many of you are taking vitamins, minerals, and fish oil every day? All right, quite a large number of you. Um, you might be taking it in a preventative matter, or you might be taking it uh, just for a specific condition. But, big question, how is it that our ancestors could thrive and they didn't take supplements every day? We really need these supplements. That's the topic I'd like to get into. And what I hope to do today is give you some reasons to be a little bit skeptical and to maybe question whether you should be taking routine supplements this sort of every day. Because it's maybe not necessary and it might even be counterproductive. Now I want to uh, pick up on a remark that Nassim Taleb made the other day, which is that maybe we should look at things in a bimodal fashion. Uh, for the vast majority of our cases that are healthy, the ink growth, don't fix it. But the caveat here is that short-term supplementation might be a good idea. You have malnutrition, infection, illness, pregnancy, or if you have some specific athletic goals. So I'm not saying don't ever take supplements. This is just a general uh, consideration for people who are healthy. The talk is going to first start out with discussion on the positive arguments for taking nutrition supplements. I'll go over those, and I'd like to raise at the beginning some general doubts and objections, but I'd like to get into four illustrative examples. Antioxidants, vitamin D, calcium, and the omega-3 fatty acids that are commonly taken in fish oil. And in all of this, I'd like to point out the role of hormesis. Obviously, to make a thorough case against nutrition supplements, you have to consider a lot more, more examples. 20 minutes, that's about what you can do. So what's the, maybe the paleo, you might call it, case for nutritional supplements? Well, if you look at it from an evolutionary standpoint, at some point in our history, we got to, uh, a lot of mammals can actually make their own vitamin C, make their own nutrients, but at some point, simians and humans lost the ability to make their own vitamin C, getting it through and therefore uh, energetically gave up the ability to synthesize it. Uh, we could get adequate vitamin D and omega trees from the environment or from the sun in the savanna. But then as we moved into northern climates and started working in offices, we were not getting enough vitamin D. And our soils, which once supplied adequate uh, minerals, are deficient in many cases. Our seas, oceans uh, are not um, producing fish with the same levels of omega-3 when we move them to uh, fish farms. So those are some of the general considerations that people raise in the paleo community. But now let me re raise a couple of general points that we'll go into when we talk about specific examples. First of all, you're not what you eat, what your body does is what you eat. We're not just an empty sack of chemicals and you dump the nutrients and then they go where you want. And most of you know this who, uh, when you think about macronutrients like proteins and carbohydrates and fats, the liver obviously transforms excess glucose into triglycerides and uh, protein at a high level can, can give rise to glucose through gluconeogenesis. And even fiber gets transformed in the gut through microchloride through short chain fatty acids. So there are all these transformations going but you know, the same thing applies to micronutrients as well. They're not necessarily what we put in the body. We know this in the case of certain minerals that may not be well absorbed, and that's been shown in the case of calcium, for example. Certain nutrients like antioxidants and fatty acids can be oxidized, and that changes their function. And other vitamins, so-called vitamins like vitamin D, actually have hormonal action very complex signaling and turn on hundreds of genes. So I have to consider those effects. And expanding on this last point, my second major point is that nutrients are regulated homeostatically. If you 
dump in some excess of certain nutrients, or the body compensates often by down-regulating uh, levels or even endogenous defenses. And we'll get into that in the case of the antioxidants. So now a little bit about antioxidants. Uh, how many of you recognize this guy? All right, yeah, Linus Pauling, two-time Nobel laureate, famous for his uh, work on the chemical bond and on the structure of proteins, also got a Nobel Prize uh, in the area of peace. Um, later in his life, he became fascinated with this idea of orthomolecular medicine, the idea that reactive oxygen species play havoc with uh, a number of processes in the body, leading to uh, problems such as colds, infections, and even, uh, even cancer. But he advocated megadosing vitamin C. I actually had the pleasure of meeting, talking to clients for an undergrad at Stanford, and at that time I was taking uh, vitamin C, basically following his ideas. And of course, there's a range of other antioxidants that can go after reactive, reactive oxygen species. One of the arguments for antioxidants is that uh, the benefits of eating fruits and vegetables is well known. A lot of positive health benefits. People consume a lot of fruits and vegetables, live longer, have fewer degenerative diseases. And often it's believed that's because of the content of antioxidants. But I'll come back to that point later. I know that's really the case. Now let's look at interventional studies. There's a couple of large uh, meta-analyses, one done in 2004, published by the AMA, the AMA but 20 different studies, supplementation with C, E, and beta-carotene, found no reduction in cardiovascular disease, stroke mortality. Another one done in 2008, Cochrane, uh, also added selenium into the mix, and again, found no reduction in mortality. Again, these are meta-analyses. Um, for those of you who are athletes, you should be concerned because there's a study showing that adding antioxidants can adversely impact exercise performance. There's one by uh, Bristow, uh, adding vitamin C and E and exercising for four weeks. And they showed, looking at different transcripts here, um, that measures of uh, insulin sensitivity and uh, so antioxidant enzyme levels were decreased in those who are taking the supplements. Or not necessarily decrease, but the benefits of the exercise. Okay, so what could be going wrong here? Well, oxidative stress, I'll always think of as a bad thing, isn't always bad, because reactive oxygen species are essential for cell signaling, they're involved in exercise regulation, and fighting infection, and yes, it's true that a high level of um, oxidative stress is bad, but maybe a moderate level of oxidative stress play for medical in improving mitochondrial function and upregulating endogenous antioxidant enzymes. And in addition, just dumping in this, this excess of antioxidants can indiscriminately suppress that signaling down rate. So what is this endogenous antioxidant defense? What are these um, inherent ability to detoxify the end of the body. There's something called the xenobiotic metabolism, phase two antioxidant enzymes which catalytically neutralize toxins. And this includes superoxide dismutase, glutathione reductase, and a whole host of other um, enzymes. Now, why do we have these? Well, we've evolved to deal with toxins in the environment, and specifically we've evolved, we've evolved to eat vegetables and plants which have their own toxins as defenses. And exposure over uh, uh, millennia has uh, given us the ability to um, produce these enzymes. Specifically, there's some polyphenolic compounds which uh, Rattan has called hormatins, which activate the NERF2 pathway that produces these enzymes. And these hormatins or polyphenols are found in brightly colored bitter plants. They've been isolated and identified as compounds like resveratrol and sulforaphane, which is in broccoli and sprouts, human, which is in turmeric, and of course, green tea. I'd like to really make a clear distinction between supplements and polyphenols. In supplements, you know, like the antioxidants and the minerals, you're adding something to apparently corrected deficiency. Hormatins, 
spices, the herbs, and the phytonutrients are activating your body's endogenous defenses, and there's a very important difference. And hormatins work synergistically and often at very low with those. Hormatins are really just agents of hormesis. What is hormesis? This is a, the effect of materials which are stressful or toxic to the body at high levels, oops, at high levels, way up here, but at low levels, you actually get a positive response. And this is due, we believe, to the fact that they activate our defense repair mechanisms in the body. Now, Edward Pellegrisi and Suresh Rattan have done a lot of research, and they've published um, examples, countless examples, in all different animals, humans, plants, of hormesis. What's really important to understand is that the dose effect is different. So that, if, for example, ethanol, works at much higher concentrations as a hormetic ingredient, you know, in the grams per kilogram range, whereas, for example, certain pesticides, uh, toxic, still give a hormetic effect at very low PPM levels. On my blog, I talk about a number of these different hormones. So that's the endogenous defense. The other thing to keep in mind with antioxidants is that there's a recycling effect that goes on. Now, when you're talking about an antioxidant like vitamin C, you get the reactive oxygen species, and, and might give rise to, for example, peroxide ion, or superoxide ion, and it's one for one neutralized by the antioxidant. However, when you talk about your, your antioxidant enzymes, glutathione and that case, it cycles, and you keep recharging and regenerating this organ so that it keeps on giving. It's like the Energizer button, right? In addition, even though people think you can't store vitamin C, it's water soluble, and that therefore we have to take care of high levels, in fact, there is a capacity to store it in the adrenal thymus and pituitary. So the take home message with antioxidants is based on the fact that we do, we can store it, we can cycle it, and that we have these endogenous defenses, which we can upregulate by the polyphenolic hormones. Um, we may not need as much uh, vitamin C as everybody thinks. In addition, the interventional studies don't really show the benefit. Now let's shift to uh, uh, vitamin D. A little bit different case. Uh, we had a really good talk by Chris uh, Masterjohn yesterday. You can get it from the diet, you can get it from the action of UV on the skin. But keep in mind that the supplement you're taking is not the biologically active form. It has to be converted in the kidney and in the liver. Uh, if you look at it, it's true. Low vitamin D3 status correlates with higher heart disease, stroke, and immune problems, and infection, and overall mortality. But is low D3 the cause or the consequence of health issues? Maybe healthy people are getting more sun and exercise, or would be in their D3 levels. The low D3 is illnesses for other reasons. In fact, they often have elevated forms of the active uh, calcitropin trial, the one. So could vitamin D, as measured by the D3, actually be just a biomarker for health and not causal? If you look at the interventional studies where people have been given this, key study in 2010 by the AMA supplementing for five years elderly women, and it, uh, it actually produced 15% more falls and 26 more fractures. It didn't get the benefit that was expected. The National Cancer Institute did another study showing that uh, elevated 25D was linked to aggressive prostate cancer. Keep in mind, vitamin D is called vitamin, but it's actually a sequosteroid and it has hormonal action. It interacts with the vitamin D receptor and it does, in fact, provide some short-term benefits. It controls infection, it controls autoimmunity, but it's a hormone. Long-term supplementation might inhibit the action of the biologically active Healthy trial, it might da downregulate the vitamin D receptor function. So, again, could have short term benefits, but do you want to be taking it every day? Is there an alternative that gives us some of the benefits without maybe the risks? There was a really interesting study by a Danish group, Claire Hansen, and they studied all the pathways that are activated by the key receptor, the BDR. And here's a quote um, they found an interesting correlation between. Uh, Autophagy and vitamin D action. Autophagy could be a general mediator of the health-promoting effects of the calcitriol. 
Accordingly, there's a striking overlap among the diseases promoted by vitamin D deficiency and the effective autophagy. Well, autophagy is really just a cellular house cleaning process. It means it's self-eating, recycling the damaged components of the cell, and it's activated by hormetic processes like calorie restriction and exercise. It regulates the same pathways. It inhibits mTOR, Bethlin 1 and Bethlin 2. It inhibits carcinogenesis and tuberculosis in the same manner. So again, vitamin D, be wary of supplementing at high doses and consider that you might be able to get some of the same benefits by practices like intermittent fasting or exercise. Let's talk about calcium. Uh, again, related to vitamin D and that both are connected with bone formation and we know that deficiencies can lead to rickets in extreme cases or osteoporosis in the elderly. But what did the interventional studies show? Well, there was a Harvard study of 77,000 nurses for 12 years took no protection for bone fracture in dosing calcium either from dairy or supplements. And there are some studies from Australia and the UK that show basically the same thing. I think the issue is in calcium is, is the, the, the calcium is it getting to where you need it in the bones. You know that it's tightly regulated in the blood. You know that high vitamin D can complete levels of K2, which are required to direct it to the bone. And we know that eating a, a diet that's high in grains, containing phytates, can bind calcium, leading to poor absorption. And similarly, uh, you know, eating a diet that's high in glycemic can leach calcium from the bone. So, Basically, taking calcium supplements doesn't ensure it's going to get into your bones. A better way is perhaps to eat whole foods, kale, beans, and very critically, eat weight-bearing exercise to drive and stimulate calcium uh, incorporation in bones. Finally, I'd like to end very briefly um, with a discussion of omega-3 supplements. I think fish are, are great. And fish oil, I was taking for a long time, but I'm still not sure you should be taking it every day unless you have a condition that requires it. We know, of course, that EPA and DHA are critical to brain, eye, and heart function, and that a low omega-3 to omega-6 ratio is implicated in all kinds of degenerative diseases. We know that as we have poor conversion efficiency, somewhere between 4 and 20 percent uh, conversion. And we don't get enough essential fatty acids from the fish, so we're recommending you know, Supplements are only recommended. Uh, don't want to get into all of the details here, but there's dozens of conditions which are uh, related to low um, essential fatty acid status. However, again, looking at some recent studies, one in fact from this year, a study of 2,000 men found that those with the highest blood levels of EPA and DHA had significantly higher risk of prostate cancer. And these replicate some earlier studies in 2011. Now, you might ask why, how could that be? You know, fish oil, such a good thing. Well, uh, if you look at a careful analysis, it was really those with the highest DHA levels that had the prostate cancer. And that's even more surprising because DHA was told is such a great thing. The problem may be, and Nina Bailey points this out, that DHA is very, very unstable and subject to lipid oxidation. So it could be that is the, the oxidized form that's causing the problems. So that should tell us again, it's not just what we put in our mouth, it's what the body does with it. And I'd like to end here with a very interesting insight from the book by Volokh and Finney on the art and science of low carbohydrate living. And Volokh and Finney pointed out in chapter nine that low carb diets dramatically increase the end product incorporation of DHA in muscle membranes. And that's associated with improved insulin sensitivity, and it inhibits lipogenesis. What's really interesting is that happens despite the fact that the um, desaturases and the elongases involved here are expressed at much lower levels than those who eat the low-carb diets, at about 50% the level, and yet you end up with high DHA at the end. How could that be? And what, what uh, Bullock and Finney point out is that because you're dramatically reducing the active oxygen species. Um, the DHA is not being peroxidized, it's surviving, it's being effectively incorporated. So again, it's not put in your mouth, it's what ends up in the body. Essentially, um, it 
diets controlling fate. So I'd like to summarize a couple parting thoughts. First of all, these recommended daily allowances, or DRIs as they're now called, or supplements, where did they come from? They came from studies in the 1940s, World War II, but they were studies on people eating Western diets, and all of the updates have been on people eating Western diets. Those diets, we know, oxidize nutrients, they impair absorption, they impair recycling, and they downregulate our endogenous defenses. If you eat a low in insulinogenic, non inflammatory, whole food diet, you're greatly improving the efficiency of uptake cycling of those nutrients, so you may not need as much. <coughs> so phytonutrients and hormesis specifically can really boost those defenses. So in short, I hope I've given you some reasons to be a little bit skeptical about taking supplements every day. If you have specific conditions and you're being helped by the supplements, that's a different story. If you're pregnant or an athlete, maybe that's a different story. But I'd like to end there and take questions. I think that was the point of my talk is that, sure, people are low in the measure of vitamin D3. The question is, is that a cause of aging? Or is that a consequence of uh, a disease state? And given that the D3 is not the biologically active form, that's it's really the 125 that's the active form, you should be paying attention to that. So you have to question what to do about the fact that people have a high detail status. So, okay, so sorry, uh, my point is, for example, if I go back to the Caribbean, yeah. um, I'm no longer in the initial state. Um, and most people who do go back to the Caribbean or to West Africa are no longer in the initial state, but uh, unfortunately don't have a son in the UK. <laughs> so yeah. so that, that's my argument. It's, it's okay saying that we don't need supplementation if you're healthy, but some of us are unhealthy because we don't have access to natural resources. So, so right. I, I just want to make that point that this is a healthy state. You may actually not just not have the resources available to, to have the All right, thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Todd. I thought that was a great talk. Um, I had the same experience as you that I, when I was in college, I took a lot of vitamin C. And as I got older, I decided I was quite wrong. My question for you is, why was Pauline so wrong? Or did he actually contribute something to you? It's a really good question. And think about it. Pauline was a great chemist. He was looking at this as pure chemistry. Sure, you have an antioxidant and a test tube that neutralizes uh, a reactive oxygen species. He was right about that. What Pauline failed to consider was the bigger system, the biological system, and the fact that we have our own endogenous antioxidant defenses. He didn't consider it the fact that by adding these antioxidants which work in the test tube, you might be shutting down the, the more important recycling system you have. So I think he was right about the little box he was looking at. He probably didn't consider the one more patients. Hi, thanks for the talk. I wanted to ask you if you make a distinction between synthetic vitamins and vitamins that are contained in, for example, like um, Alga supplements or that come in their whole form, um, will, will they be absorbed more effectively or used more effectively by the body? It's a good point. There's obviously um, the form in which you're taking the vitamin will affect the ability to absorb it, but also when you take it in the natural form, we often find that there's a lot of minor variations, for example, vitamin E complex that comes, all of these vitamins come in complexes, so trying to pick out a single form may be overlooking, you know, the way that synergistically this whole set of nutrients, some of which we haven't even characterized exactly. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
It's a little bit dangerous to pluck out a single purified compound and assume it acts the same way as it does when it's present in the whole food. It looks like we're out of time, but 